What's up, guys? This is Lionel back again with another episode of Learn How to Code. And today we are in episode two of the Crash Course in Computer Science. So technically, we're not learning how to code yet. We're going all the way back to the basics and we are deepening our understanding and all of the foundational functional things and ways of how computers work and the history of where it all started. Shout out to Crash Course. Um, this is something that I watched when I was truck driving and I listened to the whole thing as I was going, but now I'm gonna lock in in order to try and deepen and strengthen my language. I mean, my knowledge. Sorry, it's that time, wine time. Anyway, um, you know, when I, was, when I was doing that back in the day, I kind of breezed through it purposely. And so I just want to make it a point to you guys that I'm not saying that we should like not not know our shit. We're still going to know our shit. We're going to go back and we're going to learn it, but we're not going to wait. We're building. We're building also. You guys in the school are making your portfolios. You're freelancing. You're making projects. You don't need to know how a computer thinks to go make a website for the restaurant, for your favorite restaurant. It looks old. You could do better than that. Use a um, template whoop it up fix it up you're a developer you're still a builder you know but don't get complacent every day we're trying to be better we are increasing our knowledge increasing our value and that's what i'm doing right now practicing what i preach every single day let's get into it crash course episode one the first one was the introduction so Let's get it. Project gates all the way to operating systems, virtual reality and robots. We're going to cover a lot, but just to clear things up, we are not Whoa. going to teach you how to program. Instead, we're going to explore a ro Hold on, hold on a second, guys. The sound is probably ridiculous. Range of computing topics as a discipline Much and better. a technology. Computers are the lifeblood of today's world. If they were to suddenly turn off all at once, the power grid would shut down, cars would crash. She said this in the first episode. So the introduction is. They, why did they do that? The earliest recognized device for computing was the abacus invented in Mesopotamia around 2500 BCE. It's essentially a hand-operated calculator that helps add and subtract many numbers. It also stores the current state of the computation, much like your hard drive does today. The abacus was created because the scale of society had become greater than what a single person could keep and manipulate in their mind. There might be thousands of people in a village or tens of thousands of cattle. There are many variants of the abacus, but let's look at a really basic version with each row representing a different power of 10. So each bead on the bottom row represents a single unit. In the next row, they represent 10, the row above, 100, and so on. Let's say we have three heads of cattle represented by three beads on the bottom row on the right side. If we were to buy four more cattle, we if I'm not mistaken, you can also find one of these at your local dentist's office on the children's table. We would just slide four more beads to the right for a total of seven. But if we were to add five more after the first three, we would run out of beads. So we would slide everything back to the left slide one bead on the second row to the right, representing 10, and then add the final two beads on the bottom row for a total of 12. This is particularly useful with large numbers. So if we were to add 1,251, we would just add one to the bottom row, five to the second row, two to the third row, and one to the fourth row. We don't have to add in our head, and the abacus stores the total for us. Over the next 4,000 years, humans developed all sorts of clever computing devices, like the astrolabe, which enabled ships to calculate their latitude at sea, or the slide rule for assisting with multiplication and division. And there are literally hundreds of types of clocks created that could be used to calculate sunrise, tides, positions of celestial bodies, and even just the time. Each one of these devices made something that was previously laborious to calculate much faster, easier, and often more accurate. It lowered the barrier to entry and at the same time amplified our mental abilities. Woo! She is spitting facts. Bro, in our podcast today, we were literally just talking about this with React and different levels of abstraction. So we connect all the way back to the abacus in the pre days, way back. And when we're using React, it's just a long line, like uh, bricks have been building on top of each other, on top of each other. Like Tim said, coding is crystallized thought. 
It is so crazy. Thousands of years after the abacus, we now have React <laughs> and computers, and we're able to watch. Like they, they must have had no idea when they were creating that type of stuff that it would get to here. But then when we're using this stuff, why the hell would we need to know, you know, how to code in binary or stuff like that? It's good to learn this if you're the type of person who's going to be always doing better, increasing your knowledge. It's good to know this. But at the same time, don't feel bad about yourself if, if you don't understand how everything works because we're working off of levels of abstraction. And that is the way for us to, to be stronger as a humanity is by letting the new ones, the youngers, use the shit that makes it easier. And then we build faster, you know, and we keep it moving like that. Sorry, just had to get that out because we was literally just talking about this today. Y'all watch the podcast. You'll see. Take note. This is a theme we're going to touch on a lot in this series. As early computer pioneer Charles Babbage said, at each increase of knowledge, as well as on the contrivance of every new tool, human labor becomes abridged. However, none of these devices were called computers. I low-key want to look up what does abridged mean? Because he said... He said human language. Oh, having being shortened, human knowledge becomes abridged. What do you say? Every new tool, human. On the contrivance of every new tool, human labor, labor becomes shortened. Okay, why don't you just just say it in English, bruh? Human labor becomes abridged. However, none of these devices were called computers. The earliest documented use of the word computer is from 1613 in a book by Richard Braithwaite. And it wasn't a machine at all, it was a job title. Braithwaite said, I have read the truest computer of times and the best arithmetician that ever breathed, and he reduceth thy days into a short number. In those days, computer was a person who did calculations, sometimes with- All women. I heard that. Remember the movie Hidden Figures? Apparently, computers were girls the help of machines but often not. This job title persisted until the late 1800s when the meaning of computers started shifting to refer to devices. And notable among these devices was the Step Reckoner built by German polymath Gottfried Leibniz in 1694. Leibniz said, it is beneath the dignity of excellent men to waste their time in calculation when any peasant could do the work just as accurately with the aid of a machine. Sounds a little privileged. It worked kind of like the odometer in your car, which is really just a machine for adding up the number of miles your car is driven. The device had a series of gears that turned. Each gear had 10 teeth to represent the digits from 0 to 9. Whenever a gear bypassed 9, it rotated back to 0 and advanced the adjacent gear by one tooth. Kind of like when hitting 10 on that basic abacus. This worked in reverse when doing subtraction 2. With some clever mechanical tricks, the step reckoner was also able to multiply and divide numbers. Multiplications and divisions are really just many additions and subtractions. For example, if we want to divide 17 by 5, we just subtract 5, then 5, then 5 again, and then we can't subtract any more 5s. So we know 5 goes into 17 three times, with 2 left over. The Step Reckoner was able to do this in an automated way, and was the first machine that could do all four of these operations. And this design was so successful, it was used for the next three centuries of calculator design. Unfortunately, even with mechanical calculators, most real-world problems required many steps of computation before an answer was determined. It could take hours or days to generate a single result. Also, these handcrafted machines were expensive and not accessible to most of the population. Before the 20th century, most people experienced computing through pre-computated tables assembled by those amazing human computers we talked about. So if you needed to know the square root of 8,675,309, instead of spending all day hand cranking your step reckoner, you could look it up in a huge book full of square root tables in a minute or so. Speed and accuracy is particularly important on the battlefield, and so militaries were among the first to apply computing to complex problems. A particularly difficult problem is accurately firing Yeah, that's crazy, bro. They all look miserable. Artillery shells, which by the 1800s could travel well over a kilometer, or a bit more than half a mile. Add to this varying wind conditions, temperature, and atmospheric pressure, and even hitting something as large as a ship was difficult. Range tables were created that allowed gunners to look up environmental conditions and the distance they wanted to fire, and the table would tell them the angle to set the cannon. These range tables worked so well, they were used well into World War II. The problem was, if you changed the design of the cannon or of the shell, 
a whole new table had to be computed, which was massively time-consuming and inevitably led to errors. Charles Babbage acknowledged this problem in 1822 in a paper to the Royal Astronomical Society entitled Note on the Application of Machinery to the Computation of Astronomical and Mathematical Tables. Leave it to those type of guys to force us to evolve, right? Whoever said, you know what, I'm going to make a scientific paper on the note on the application of machinery to the computation of astronomical note on the application and mathematical tables application of machinery to the computation of astronomical and mathematical tables let's go to the thought bubble charles babbage proposed a new mechanical device called the difference engine a much more complex machine that could approximate polynomials polynomials describe the relationship between several variables like range and air pressure or amount of pizza carrying eats and happiness Polynomials could also be used to approximate logarithmic and trigonometric function, which are a real hassle to calculate by hand. Babbage started construction in 1823 and over the next two decades tried to fabricate and assemble the 25,000 components, collectively weighing around 15 tons. Unfortunately, the project was ultimately abandoned. But in 1991, historians finished constructing a difference engine based on Babbage's drawings and writings, and it worked. But more importantly, during construction of the difference engine, Babbage imagined an even more complex machine the analytical engine. Unlike the difference engine, step reckon on all other computational devices before it, the analytical engine was a general purpose computer. It could be used for many things, not just one particular. I wonder if they had any idea that one day people would be playing Minecraft with the, these type of, of machinery that they're starting. Probably not. They're just trying to compute, but that's so crazy when you think about it computation. It could be given data and run operations in sequence, it had memory and even a primitive printer. Like the difference engine, it was ahead of its time, it was never fully constructed. However, the idea of an automatic computer, one that could guide itself through a series of operations automatically, was a huge deal and would foreshadow computer programs. English mathematician Ada Lovelace wrote hypothetical programs for the analytical engine, saying a new, a vast and a powerful language is developed for the future use of analysis. For her work, Ada is often considered the world's first programmer. The analytical engine would go on to inspire arguably the first generation of computer scientists who incorporated many of Babbage's ideas in their machines. This is why Babbage is often considered the father of computing. Thanks, Fort Bubble. So by the end of the 19th century, computing devices were used for special purpose tasks in the sciences and engineering, but rarely seen in business, government or domestic life. However, the US government faced a serious problem for its 1819 census that demanded the kind of efficiency that only computers could provide. The US Constitution requires that a census be conducted every 10 years for the purposes of distributing federal funds, representation in Congress and good... I'm sorry for keep pausing it on these pictures, but look at the... Why is everybody so sneaky? Oh, because he's trying to say they got two people when they really got more people. Why... Why you gotta sneak that? I don't know, I'm, I'm curious. Good stuff like that. And by 1880, the US population was booming, mostly due to immigration. That census took seven years to manually compile. And by the time it was completed, it was already out of date. And it was predicted that the 1819 census would take 13 years to compute. That's a little problematic when it's required every decade. The Census Bureau turned to Herman Hollerith, who built a tabulating machine. His ma Giggle bite? When Uncle Sam hollered his name, Herman didn't disappoint. Okay. Did he like, uh, he might have served in the military or something? Giggle bite. The machine was electromechanical. It used traditional mechanical systems for keeping count, like Leibniz's step reckoner, but coupled them with electrically powered components. Hollerith's machine used punch cards, which were paper cards with a grid of locations that could be punched out to represent data. For example, there was a series of holes for marital status. If you were married, you would punch out the married spot. Then when the card was inserted into Hollerith's machine, little metal pins would come down over the card. If a spot was punched out, the pin would pass through the hole in the paper and into a little vial of mercury, which completed the circuit. This now completed- Imagine having to wear a suit to do that all day punch slide your cards into the punch hole machine a hole in the paper and into a little vial of mercury which completed the circuit this now completed circuit powered an electric motor which turned a gear to add one in this case to the married total Hollerith's machine was roughly 10 times faster than manual tabulations 
And the census was completed in just two and a half years, saving the census office millions of dollars. Businesses began recognizing the value of computing and saw its potential to boost profits by improving labor and data intensive tasks like accounting, insurance appraisals, and. Man, that's what's up. Look at these guys in their suits. Sleeves rolled up, computing, the OGs. Inventory management. To meet this demand, Hollerif founded the Tabulating Machine Company, which later merged with other machine makers in 1924 to become the International Business Machines Corporation. No way. Or IBM which you've probably heard of. These electromechanical business machines were a huge success, transforming commerce and government. And by the mid 1900s, the explosion in world population and the rise of globalized trade demanded even faster and more flexible tools for processing data, setting the stage for digital computers, which we'll talk about next week. Crash Course Computer Science is produced Bravo. in association- Bravo, that went by so fast. Um... Yo, that's crazy. I'm excited. I'm excited about this. This was the first episode. The last one was the intro. Um, and we're just starting here. There's 40 episodes. So that's why we're way back in the past. I'm glad we're, we're getting. But wait, look, you can you could know about the abacus now. You know, what I mean, that's going to be a fun fact for you to talk uh, to somebody about one day. Right. It's all about increasing our knowledge, increasing our um we're computer science scientists now, so it's going to be good. The more that we add to this, it's going to strengthen our, our abilities, add more tools to your toolbox as a developer. Uh, I have a, another video request to do here before I wrap it up for the day. I also have some other work to do, so I will get to it. And you guys have a good night. Thanks for stopping by. Please like, share, subscribe, join the school, reach out, be a part of this community, and I'll see y'all next time. Peace.